Hi, my name is Peter Rogin. This is Jazz Guitar USA. Have Guitar Will Travel. And we have a very special episode for you today. We've had so many inquiries about the guitar I'm playing right now, this Gibson L5. We're going to spend the whole time just giving you some ideas of what makes this a great guitar, who worked on it, and why it sounds as good as it does. So a couple of things right off the bat. This is a 1954 Gibson L5. Uh, one of the things, it has a thin top, which means it's louder. And uh, you'll notice I do not have a pickup on it. Uh, a guitar with a thin top might have a tendency more for uh, feedback. So I just use this guitar acoustically. It's plenty loud. If I'm doing rhythm. Just backing up a girl singer. So it gets a beautiful balance across the strings. And like I said, you can really whack this guitar. Uh, it has gauge uh, 13 bronze. The Dario's on it. That's how it gets a lot of its volume. Listen to its volume on this. And the clarity of the sound. It happens to be a real good model. Also, it's light. This is a very light guitar. Like I said, uh, lucky me. The top and the back are thin. Now, what makes the guitar expensive and good is that when Gibson made these guitars, they were using aged wood to begin with. Some of the new guitars that are coming out now from China and Korea and even Japan sometimes are using wood. That was originally a tree just maybe three months before that, so it's green. This wood was stored properly, like they do in Europe for the cellos and the violins. And it's put in a special place and there's air circulation is left to sit there for 10 years. So the wood is uh, what's called cured or dried and then when they carve it, it's ready to be done and ready to be uh, sounded. So when the guy's carving, he's going like this, with, he can really hear what's going on. Um, some of the things that have been done to this guitar that are very unique, that make it very special for me, is I had uh, Leroy over at uh, Yellow Guitars do the fretwork, very special fretwork. Uh, I use very thin frets for clarity of pitch, as recommended to me in person by Jimmy D'Aquisto, the world's greatest guitar maker. He loved thin frets. So they're all thin frets. Matter of fact, this wire, the wire right here, is from Jimmy's shop. And Leroy has that wire. And you'll notice that right over here, the fret comes right over the binding. I wanted that because I'm used to playing a little wider fingerboard. So I gained, oh, I don't know, maybe a 32nd of an inch on either side by having the fret go right over the binding and having it all filed. So it's very smooth on the hand. I don't feel any shavings or anything. And no matter what guitar you have, you can always bring it to a good guitar repairman and say, hey, you know, why don't you file the end of each fret? and that'll make it easier. You won't have that sensation of uh, roughness on your hand as you're going up and down the neck. And of course, the beauty of the guitar, like I said, the sound, uh, Leroy did the frets and they're just perfectly in tune everywhere you go. Perfectly in tune. Is that I then brought the guitar to Mirabella Guitars and Chris Mirabella in his shop, then used a special restoration process where the original lacquer is reactivated. So this is the way the guitar looked. It does have scratches and a couple of dings, of course. 1954. Uh, where the original shine was reactivated in, in a special process. And so this is what the guitar looked like coming out of the factory. So it's not a refinishing. It's a restoration. So and I don't believe we have to do any binding on this. I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe on the fingerboard. And you'll see the beautiful back of the neck. 
So uh, the tiger stripes over there on the neck. And of course, these are the original keys. And of course, that famous logo, which, you know, I, I used to dream about as a kid. And wow, there it is, the L5. Wes Montgomery played it. All the guys in the 50s used this as an acoustic guitar with big bands playing with both Sinatra and Al Martino. Everybody had a guitar like this for those gigs. And of course, it has the original bridge, a rosewood bridge to match. That's the sound. So, I'm very fortunate to have this guitar. Obviously, we're all just caretaking these guitars for the next person to get it uh, some date in the future. Uh, this is in a, uh, a redone tail uh, pick guard right here. Um, I believe Mirabella did this, Chris Mirabella did this. So uh, this guitar was like a 1954 Ford and we worked on it, combination of both guys, Leroy and Chris made this into a beautiful axe that I use every day. And I bring it to classes, I bring it to gigs and everyone is so surprised the way it sounds. My suggestion for you, and whatever level of expense you can afford, is to get yourself a real guitar that can be hooked up and played acoustically so you really get the sound, hear the sound of a guitar. Some of you are playing with gauge nines and tens, and it sounds very electrified, and you have all your pedals. But I grew up with this sound. I remember sitting at my father's desk playing his Epiphone Emperor, which we'll bring out here one day, which I still have. And uh, that's this, when I play this guitar, my mind goes all the way back to when I was first studying at it, Mel Bay 1, 2, and 3, and Rhythms Complete, at my father's desk, reading band charts, and uh, dreaming one day of becoming a pro. Well, I was still in high school, obviously. And, uh, and only suggest, put away a couple of bucks every week in a special envelope and never look at it until two years later. And then start looking around on the web, speak to your local guitar man, think about getting a box. These are called a box. A real box that you might not ever bring on a gig, but every once in a while you might get a call to do a studio session, we have to imitate the old guys playing from the 50s or the 60s rhythm guitar, or just you and a girl playing, and uh, you just want to capture that older sound, or just the clarity of a real guitar. <laughs>